heart. Just ask God to <coughs> tell us what we need to hear. Pray with me. Oh God, as we bow before you, you know what needs to be said. And, and Lord, I know I'm nothing, but you're everything. And I pray, God, if you will, speak to your people and help us get closer to you. Help us to be what you want us to be. Thank you for everyone that's here. And we pray for those who could not make it today. We pray for them. In Jesus' name, amen. <coughs> amen. Praise God. God's good. Hallelujah. And don't let this scare you, but I tell you, I was excited. <laughs> Woo. I don't know how I got out of order here, but I'm out of order. got it now but you know God when he created us when he created Adam and Eve he created us not to be a zombie God created us to help and love each other and work together the Bible has so many verses on how important it is for, for a body of believers to work together and how important it is to come to fellowship. And I don't care what they say. I know what this Bible says. This Bible says if you are a Christian, you're going to look forward to going to the house of the Lord and worship the Lord. That's what it says. That settles it. God created us. And you know the only time or the first time God said it is not good <laughs> is when it built man. <laughs> Your women ought to like that. He said it's not good that man be what? Alone. 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 And when I look at that it's not talking about a male. It's talking about the human. All of us. It's not good for us to be alone. And you and, and you know, there are people who get off into things and say, well, I'm, I'm having church at my house. And I don't have to go to church to be saved. And all this and that. <laughs> well, I just know what this Bible says. And I'm going to go by it. We need each other. It's important. What, where you are right now is very important. God designed us. He created us to be together and encourage each other and lift each other up. Amen. We are to have fellowship one with another. I want you to think with me right now. When the church was born, you read it in Acts chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost, when it fully was come, there was 120 in the upper room. In that room together. I'm glad that they didn't on their way to the upper room say, well, you know, it ain't no need of me going to church. Ain't no need of me going there. Jesus said, don't you forsake the assembling of yourself together as a matter of some is, but so much more you need to gather together in the latter days because the days will become more evil and the powers of darkness will decide to work even harder to try to stop the kingdom of God from being what it needs to be. We need each other. We need to encourage each other and we need to lift each other up. Hallelujah. But on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came, it sat upon each of those 120 of them. 120 of them. What I want you to know is, I find 
find the 120. But I can't find the 380. Because 380 of them said we don't need to go to the upper room. Jesus looked at 500 of them. He said, you go to the upper room. You gather together and you pray and you seek God until the Spirit of God comes upon you and then you work together. But only 120 went. Well, let me tell you what happened. When the Holy Spirit came on that 120, what did they do? They didn't just sit in the church house and they didn't go in a thousand different directions. They walked together as one man would walk. 120 of them stepped out into the busiest day of the year in the city of Jerusalem. Israel is the center of all water bodies. I looked at that. All water ends up in Israel. That's the reason on the day that God filled the 120 with the Holy Spirit was a day that every nation had a ship anchored on trade day. And they were standing there at 9 a.m. when the 120 came out and those people from every nation begin to talk in their language and say, what's going on? We have never seen people this happy before. What is it with these people? <clears throat> and what's amazing is the Bible says that they each one begin to hear the 120 begin to speak and glorify God and give testimony of how Jesus saved them. They, though they did not speak Hebrew or Greek, understood what these 120 were saying. God did that. And they listened to it. And all of them, let me tell you, they walked together. But the one that had the biggest mouth finally used it for God. When they said, what is this and what's going on? Peter, with the 119 others, said this is what God said would happen. That is spoken of in Joel chapter 2 verse 28. That I will pour out my spirit upon all those who would believe and the sons and daughters will be able to prophesy Speak the word of God. Old men will dream dreams. This is the way you know if you're old or young. <laughs> if you're dreaming, you're old. And young ones have visions. But anyway, old men will dream dreams. Young ones will have visions. On my servants, on my handmaids, I pour out my spirit and there will be a move of God on planet earth. The kingdom of God will begin to be built in the kingdom of God. God's people, in our hearts. That 120 spoke out. Peter says, this is that, what God said would happen. Peter says, this is it. And you know, he didn't beg anybody to do anything. He didn't beg them. Lord, forgive me, but he didn't say if you put $10 in the offering, you'll have $100 in your mailbox to bar. He didn't say that. He didn't say none of that stuff. You know what he did? When they said, what is this? He said, this is that what the prophet Joel said would happen. And that our the, the son of the living God, your sins and my sins, had him crucified. He died for our sins. He was buried. But the third day he rose from the dead. And he says he would pour his spirit out upon all that would believe. 
we believed, and he saved our, our soul. He wrote our names down in heaven, and he filled us with the Holy Spirit. That's all Peter said. What happened next? 3,000 people screamed out and says, What do we do to be saved? Tell us how to be saved. Peter says, Repent and be baptized and call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Ask him to forgive your sins, wash them away. Your name will be written in heaven. You can be born again. 3,000 business people got on their knees on that dusty street there where they were in Jerusalem and asked Jesus Christ to forgive them of their sins and wash their sins away and write their name in heaven. What happened then? Did they say we don't need each other? Or I don't have to go to church? You know what my Bible says? My Bible says that they began to fellowship and break bread <coughs> every day. Man, they had church every day. Some people think that they don't need to come but once a year, and that's on Easter. And some of them don't even think they need to come then. My friend, let me tell you something. We come to church for one reason, and that's to worship God. Amen. To give God glory. People say, well, when I go to church, I don't get nothing out of it. You ain't supposed to get nothing out of it. You're supposed to put something in it. Amen. And I'm not talking about money. I'm talking about you're to put the worship and the praise and you're to testify and tell what God is doing and glorify God. David said, I'm glad when they said, let's go in the house of the Lord. Well, let me tell you, Peter, when he preached, the 3,000 got saved. What happened right after that? It's 3,000, 120 of them praising God and the next thing you know, 5,000 more says, what do we do to be saved? Now it's 8,120 of them praising God. If they would have isolated themselves like some people are doing today, thinking they don't need to gather together, we would not even be here today. We wouldn't even, we would be in hell if we were, they were born to start with. We need each other. We got to have each other. We must have each other. Hallelujah. I'm going to read a couple of scriptures. I'm going to read out of 2 Corinthians chapter 1 and then I'm going to go to Hebrews <coughs> chapter 10. But 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 3. Blessed be, I'm um, 2 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 3. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. I love that. Who comforts us in, I circle this word, how much of our tri tribulation? All our tribulation. That we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. My friend, you don't have to have a, a degree in philosophy to understand that right there. It tells how important it is that we come together, we love God, we allow God to comfort us, we comfort each other, and then we leave from here to go reach out to those who are in trouble to comfort them. But you cannot comfort anybody until you're, you yourself have been comforted and God is the comforter. And that is 1 Corinthians, I mean 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. And I like it where Jesus says, I'm not going to leave you without a comforter. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. He's going to abide with you forever. He will comfort you. And you will need to take 
him with you. He won't leave you and go comfort others. I go to Hebrews chapter 10 now. Chapter 10, verse 23. <sighs> Hebrews 10, 23. I can't help this. I do it all the time. Let's start with verse 22. It's too good. All right, now I'm in Hebrews chapter 10, and I'm on verse 22. Let us draw near. And you know, us means it's not, if you by yourself, that ain't no us, is it? So he's speaking to the church, to the body of believers, to you and I, all of us. Let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. <coughs> you know, that's one thing about it. And what I want to talk to you about today is we come together to encourage each other. And when you come to Christ, your past is gone. Your sins are washed away. And you should have full assurance that your heart has been sprinkled and that you are not to have an evil conscience if you have called on the name of the Lord God Almighty, the Lord Jesus Christ, to forgive you of your sins because he washes <laughs> your sins away, my sins away, and we do not need to keep on bringing it up, saying we might not be forgiven when we've asked him what we're doing, we're making like, without realizing it, that the blood of Jesus Christ is not able to wash our sins away. My friend, when you get on your heart, your knees, and pray from your heart, God, forgive me of my sins, and I confess I'm a sinner. Forgive me. And then he saves you. He washes your sins away. And then if you let your mouth get in trouble, you in trouble today, you get on your knees and say, Lord, forgive me. He forgives you. And quit condemning yourself and beating yourself up. If God forgives you, he forgives you, and you don't forget that. Verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. Amen. Let us consider, look at verse 24. Let us, there's that word us, consider one another. So that means a group, doesn't it? Let us consider one another to provoke unto love to good works. Verse 25, I wish the world could hear this. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much more the more as you see the day approaching. He's speaking of the last days. Let me tell you, we need to assemble together. And I always show y'all this. I like this. I got in here what I estimated was going to be the amount of people here today. It ain't, a, it ain't a person in this building can break this. I don't care how strong you think you are. You will not break this. But what the devil wants to do is he does not like you to be in fellowship together in a body together. What he's going to do is say, you don't have to go to church. You can just make it by yourself. Look, I'm weak, but watch here. Broke to pieces. It crumbled. But I can't do nothing with this. But he pull you out one at a time. He can't do nothing with you when you're together. We're together. But when you're separated, you 
are in dangerous territory. Let's not be separated. Sin wants to deceive you and make you think you can make it by yourself. We need each other. God never built for us to be alone. He wants us to come together. In 1 Thessalonians 3, 2, <coughs> Timothy was sent to do one thing, to strengthen and encourage the church. <coughs> we are here today to strengthen each other and encourage each other. And I got to studying that word encourage, and you know what encourage has got in it? Courage. Encourage means that you are telling somebody to stand the ground, keep your head up, you're going to make it. It's a positive thing. It's a good thing. And we need to grow. We need to help each other. And we are called to be encouragers. You are called to encourage somebody. Amen. And you know what? I won't waste a lot of time, but I grew up in this church. And I can show you where the people sit. They never said anything, but they never missed church either. That said a lot to me. One of them sat on that fourth row out right there. He had a new pickup that was about three days old. His grandson wanted to learn to drive. His grandson, 14 years old. Mr. Dennis says, all right, we'll, let's learn to drive. So Mr. Dennis helps him backs up, but the little feller, it was gravel down that road then. He got mixed up on the brake and the gas. <clears throat> and he hit a tree so hard it totaled that truck out and put both of them in the hospital at some of them. I went to the hospital to see both of them, to pray for them. And oh, they was cut up, looked bad. And pick up just a few days old was no longer good for anything but just maybe a part here or a part there. I went back like the next day to check on them. The insurance man come walking in the door <coughs> and says, I got good news for you, Mr. Dennis. Got the check for you. You had full coverage on your pickup. Here it is. What you want me to do with it? He says it's going to be up to you. You can tear it up, throw it in that garbage can right there. Or you can take it back, throw it in the garbage can at your work. And that man backed up. I know this man. <laughs> he backed up and he said, what are you talking about? He says, I was not driving that truck. That man says, I know that, but nobody else will know it. Mr. Dennis says, the Lord knows it, and I would be wrong to take that. And I might cry right now, but that's the best sermon I ever heard in my life. That insurance man walked out with that check. For the price of that brand new truck. Mr. Dennis looked at me and he says, God will not be pleased because that's telling a lie. I can't take that money. Mr. Dennis is in heaven today. I tell you that. And that's just one of them. There's two or three more in here that did things. They never talk and you never... In fact, they didn't, it wasn't nothing wrong except they just didn't want to pray in public. 
So they would tell the preacher, listen, this, don't call on me to pray uh, because I really can't pray in public. But you know what? The Christians, they in heaven, the ones I'm talking about. That was an encouragement to me spiritually. And you can be an encourager to somebody one way or another. And God wants <laughs> us, he's called us, to be encouragers. We need each other. In fact, Jesus' last words on planet earth was to encourage and lift each other up and love one another so that you can reach the world. We've got to work together. <clears throat> A church that can't love each other and work together, the world can see that. They can feel that. We need love for each other. You know, you don't have to like me, but you got to love me. Amen. <laughs> and there are people maybe you might not like, but you love them. Forgive them. Seventy times seven, if you have to, in one day. But we live in a broken world. We live in a world that's going down fast. It's falling fast. Not just the United States of America, the whole world is going down. And the only hope for the people in the world is the Lord Jesus Christ and you may be the only one that might reach that one person or those several people. But the definition of encouragement is to inspire someone, to give someone courage so they won't be afraid or help someone alone. Give to them the word of God. Tell them about the love of Jesus and encourage them. If you ne neglect Christian meetings, you've given up two, two different things. You, well, you, you've given up more than that. But you've given up the encouragement that you will give to somebody else and the encouragement that you would need yourself and the Word of God. Whether you know it or not, each one of you sitting out there right now are an encouragement to me right now. You encourage me. You help me. If you don't believe me, just go with me when I have to visit the doctor again. And they might, with my permission, let you read that where he put, if it weren't for a good God and a good praying church, this man wouldn't be here. See, we need each other, my friend. And people need encouragement. I want to tell you, it was odd that, but it was God that did it, that I was felt to encourage people. But I decided to read the history of Chick-fil-A. And as I began to read the history of Chick-fil-A, and what made me want to is, years back, I heard Samuel Truett Kathy, C-A-T-H-Y. He's the one that started Chick-fil-A. I heard him give the testimony. And let me tell you what, it, it, it really touched me. I heard it on the radio, on, on the 89.7. Uh, they had him on a network where he was live. He passed away, he went to heaven in 2014. In fact, it was September the 19th of 2014. He was born March the 14th, 1921. Samuel Truett Cat. What he did was he had two cafes. And I believe I'm telling you right. But it was three of them in business together. 
his two brothers, but they were killed in a car wreck, which made him to be alone. So here he is to make a living. But yet he said the most important thing, I read this, <laughs> that there is, is not to serve good food. It's to be a servant and encourage people. One day, I read this, a professor came in of, <coughs> I don't know if it was psychologist or whatever, but he came in to eat a meal, and it wasn't but 10 chairs in this cafe. The big one burnt down just days before that. Now he's just got the one little one. 10 little seats in it. Professor comes in there, and Truett says, I want to encourage people. How will I know who needs to be encouraged? The professor answered this, and I quote him. If that person is breathing, if he's breathing, he needs encouragement. Because this world drains everything out of a human being. Everybody needs encouragement. In 1946, it's when Truett started Chick-fil-A. On those, in that one little building that the other one built, burnt down. What happened was that two people that were coming in to eat were the people who sold chicken breast to airline companies. And here they are right out of Atlanta, Georgia, and I don't know if y'all ever been in a jet airplane that landed at the airport at Atlanta, Georgia. You are lost. That's such a big place. I didn't even know which. Here I am going to preach a funeral, and they land and don't even tell me which way to go to go catch another, and they're like, no, I made it in time. But anyway, here, they bring, or the, they are the salesman of chicken breast. <laughs> Number one, chicken breast. And they asked Truett, do you want to have that to maybe serve that as a special meal? Well, Truett says, well, I got time now since my other place is burnt. And uh, I would experiment and come up with recipes and I will do that. I will buy chicken breast. Number one, chicken breast, chickens without any chemicals or anything raised. He gets that and he comes up with a recipe. And people liked it so much, it did not even take but just a few months. 1,927 Chick fil A's in America. And you know, you might have saw the news a few years back. He stood the ground and he preached, he told the word of God and he loved people. But when they got to talking about the gays can get married and all, he simply says, the Bible is against that. A group of people decide to boycott him. If you watched it on the news, it was comical. They boycotted every Chick-fil-A. But as far as you could see, the cameras of, of, of what channel you was on, there was cars lined up to get Chick-fil-A. For the first time, the Chick-fil-A's ever won in America ran out. All 1,947 of them ran out of chick, chicken that day for dinner. And so the news person asked this man, he walked from his work close by, he said, you've been in this line for right in an hour and it's so long, uh, what you going to do? He said, I'm going to stay in the line. He said, well, you know they're out of chicken. He said, well, if they got a glass of water, I'll buy it. Because this man has been an encourager to everybody. My friend, he started, let me tell you what. Truett started a foundation called 
windshield to help get problem children on the right path. He opened up orphanages. He, uh, in fact, there was one little guy that somebody in his one of in his in his little bitty restaurant one time spoke of her child that wanted to go to college and had him a mayonnaise jar, hoping that everybody would put in it, but he's in the 12th grade and fixing to graduate and looks like he's not going to make it to college. Truett says, I want to meet your, your son. Truett went and met him. He said, son, where do you want to go to college? He says, well, I'm not going to be able to go because I don't have the money. He says, let's not talk about money. Where do you want to go? And what do you want to major in? The little fella told him, sure, got a hold of that college and paid the four years right then. Uh, I don't know the numbers, but he give, they give thousands. In fact, there's $50 million dollars it was given just a couple years ago in scholarship. Every year they give thousands of dollars scholarship to people that want to go to college and can't go. You see, he's an encourager. And he said, my number one job is to encourage people, to encourage them and tell them that Jesus Christ is the only way and the only hope and that we are to help each other. And we are called, my friend, to be encouragers, and that's what Truett said he wanted to be. And he's gave thousands and thousands of dollars. And people say that's the best chicken you'll ever eat. That's what they say. But he said he asked God to give him the recipe, and God gave it. The man's in heaven, but his children are still running it. They build him one of them in Macomb right now. Truett was an encourager. He's helped a many a person, a many a testimony of people that gave up on life. He encouraged them and helped them. And everybody that worked for him or employed, none of them was ever fired and none of them ever quit. They just maybe got retired or had to move and went to another cheap for what? So that tells you something. But the message today is not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, but do what Jesus says. We need to do what? Encourage each other. I turn it over to you, Brother Lynn, and I hope it makes sense. What did we talk about today? Be an encourager. Encourage somebody. You don't know. I had a person tell me a couple years ago that I talked to them and they were going to plan to commit suicide that night and they changed their mind. I had no idea that was on their mind. Didn't know it. But see, what I'm telling you is you go with a positive, good attitude, listen to God, and if God tells you to go see somebody and talk to them, don't put it off. <coughs> I made that mistake one time and the man died the next morning and I was I felt to go see him and talk to him I'm guilty and I hope God forgives me I know he will but be an encourager 